In the Lutheran Church, traditionally, there are only about three times during the church year where you'll see red pyramids, red stole and chasuble and all these other things. And that would be Pentecost, which was this last Sunday. That would be ordination, insulation of a pastor, uh, which happens whenever it happens. And that would be Reformation Day. Now, obviously, that isn't celebrated everywhere. I, I, I don't think that you'll see too many Roman Catholics wearing red on Reformation Day. But, you know, there's, there's always time to improve. But this past Sunday was Pentecost. Now, Pentecost, this is the celebration of this event that took place, often marking uh, or often seen as marking the beginning of the physical church on earth. Now, obviously, God has been around and there have been faithful people since the beginning of creation. Adam and Eve were created as faithful people and God has been with them the entire time. But Pentecost is the time when we can point to and say, look, God promised to establish a Christian church on earth, not, not, not a temple system, not the synagogue system, but a Christian church on earth. And Pentecost is really the event that we point to to say this is this is when God w- went ahead and did that. This is when he bestowed his holy, you know, when God bestowed the Holy Spirit, also God, another person of the Trinity, bestowed the Holy Spirit and appeared like tongues of flame over the heads of the disciples. It's, it's, it's a fantastic event. And one of the interesting things, there's multiple readings that you can do for this. One of the interesting pairings, I mean, obviously one of the ones that jumps out, the Old Testament pairing with that Acts chapter 2 passage is the story of the Tower of Babel, or Babel, however you want to pronounce it. I usually use Babel. But what jumped out to me this year as I was reading the text, I mean, last year I, I talked about, I preached about what does it mean to, to speak in tongues and what does it not mean to speak in tongues. But this year, what was particularly interesting to me was how God worked to reconcile the damage done at the Tower of Babel. Now, I thought it was a particularly clever title of the sermon. Maybe the sermon itself wasn't so good, but the title was Not Good as New, But Better Than Ever. So this is me telling you how God sometimes chooses to make things not good as new, but better than ever. So let's get into it. There are many different examples in the Bible of things going wrong, and of course there are many different examples of God fixing those things that went wrong. There are some examples where God takes something broken and he makes it like new again. Now, the first uh, the first thing that, that comes to my mind when I hear that is actually uh, Jesus when he cures leprosy or uh, curing the leprosy of, uh, I think it's Naaman in the Old Testament, is that this person washes and God cures them miraculously and their skin is like new, like new. And I often think about when I have something that's broken, when I have a, a, a broken car part or a broken computer or broken, whatever it is, a lot of times I'll go and I'll try to repair it. If, if it can't be repaired, I'll replace it. And the idea for repairing it is that I want it to be made as close to factory new as possible, as close to brand new as possible. And this is often how we see, how we see kind of repair. We repair or replace, we renew something. Uh, if something's wrong with the computer, for example, I'll reinstall everything and, and, and return it to factory settings and then, you know, work from there. Now, God does this sort of restoration where he does make things like new. Again, uh, leprosy uh, being turned into brand new skin is, is a great example of this, but he does this other kind of restoration where instead of making things good as new, he makes them better than ever before. Now, Pentecost uh, contrasted or compared with the Tower of Babel is an excellent example of this. So the story of the Tower of Babel is the people of the earth all gathered in a singular location and decided to build a tower. Now, this was very, very naughty of them. They were not supposed to be gathering together. Specifically, God said, you need to disperse over the entire earth. You need to fill the earth, uh, you know, subdue all the animals, whatever. The earth I have made for you. Go to all the corners of the earth. This is what God says. So mankind, doing what mankind does, decided to be disobedient and gather together in one place. It isn't a sin that they built a a large tower. I've heard people say that before, like skyscrapers are, you know, God's got a height limit on towers and you can't build something too high or else God's going to be. No, that's not. The sin is that they disobeyed God when he said to spread over all the earth. Now, as a consequence for their sin, as a consequence for their sin, God confused the languages and forced them to disperse. All their, you know, proto-Mandarin, you go over there, and proto-German go over there, and proto-King James-only English go over there. And you've got the different languages kind of, kind of 
force people to disperse where they would say, well, I can't communicate with anybody else. So how can I interact with them? You know, having different languages, nobody had developed any sort of translation yet at that point. The, the concept of a translation between multiple languages would have been unheard of. Or somebody who speaks multiple languages, that so would have been unheard of. It's hard to put ourselves in that mindset where there was only one language there at all time that all of a sudden people are somehow communicating with each other and they can understand each other, but we can't understand them. Like, how do you bridge that gap? This was a new thing, this creation of multiple languages with a division of one language into multiple languages. So this is what happens at the Tower of Babel. This is the consequence of sin. It's, 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 it's a negative consequence, really. It's intended to kind of, it's, it's discipline. It's go out and spread out now. Now you have to spread out. Now, if God wanted to resolve this by making things like new again, if you wanted to make things like new again, how would he resolve this? He would return it to its factory setting, to its previous state. He might, at Pentecost, you know, snap his fingers, and all of a sudden everybody's speaking King James English as they were, you know, in the Garden of Eden. But that's not what he does. Instead of making things like new, he makes them better than ever. So God retains the multiplicity of languages and dialects and unifies them all under a single Christian church and a single gospel, a single Savior. One Lord, one baptism, one God and Father of all. He unifies them in something less, I don't want to say trivial like languages, but really there's a superficiality behind languages that isn't there in the gospel. How you say something is not as important as what is being communicated itself. So the gospel unifies, whereas languages were, you know, divided. They were unified before, but they're divided. So rather than good as new, he makes it better than ever. And now you have a, a, a symphony, an orchestra, many different languages, all glorifying God in their own unique beauty, in their own unique capacity. You have, you know, you can now glorify God in English, in Spanish, in Hawaiian pigeon, in German, in Sanskrit, in all these different languages. And there's there's a beauty behind each of these languages that they can that they can sort of bring this new perspective. Of, of glorifying God. So this is better. This is better than just having one language that glorifies God. Now you've got many different ways to glorify God, all working in unison with the same gospel, the same church. Now, this is a pattern that I was that I was thinking about in the Bible, and, and I'll be interested. If you want to leave some comments in the comment section, I'll be interested in considering these. Um, other times in the Bible where God fixes a problem, not by returning it to its default state, but by making something new out of it. Now, something else that came to mind when I was thinking about this, this wasn't one of the readings, but I you know, threw it in there because, you know, who's going to stop me? Uh, the Genesis reading, uh, well, it's not a Genesis reading. <laughs> the Genesis account, it wasn't a reading for this Sunday, of Adam and Eve in the garden. Adam and Eve in the garden were ignorant as children. They did not know evil. They had to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil to have the capacity to understand good and evil. And the Bible says that when they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, their eyes were opened. So they had, they had a new capacity to understand. And the consequence of their disobedience and sin was death. Death was, you know, entered into the world, sin, everything else. Everything else kind of cascaded from that, from that moment. But before that moment, they were ignorant. They were blissfully ignorant of good and evil, of the knowledge of good and evil. They did not have that. Now, if God wanted to resolve this problem... He would return mankind to ignorance. When you die and you go to heaven, then you become ignorant. On the other hand, what God does is he says, okay, I'm going to retain this knowledge of good and evil. Humanity continues to have good and evil, or the knowledge of good and evil, and unfortunately the capacity for good and evil. But instead, I'm going to give something better. He completes that knowledge. So it's not just the knowledge of good and evil, but it's also the knowledge of forgiveness and salvation. How could Adam and Eve possibly comprehend forgiveness if they couldn't comprehend sin in the first place? How could they know what it meant to be forgiven if they didn't know what it meant to do something wrong that needed to be forgiven? So God took this thing, this, this, this curse that resulted from their sin and their knowledge of good and evil, this broken state that they were in, and he turned it into something better. Rather than returning humanity to ignorance, he increased the knowledge if a bit of knowledge was dangerous for us, he perfected that knowledge so it would no longer be dangerous for us. Well, I mean, it still is dangerous for us, but we have a conclusion that, that we know what to do. Okay, yes, now you have the knowledge of, of, of good and evil, and you sin. But Jesus Christ died on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins, and now you have that. So these are some examples 
of, of how God takes something broken and, and turns it into something better. Not good as new, but better than ever. Now, the final example that I use, I believe, well, I use two more examples. One of the final examples that I used was I talked about life, life and death. And on the Garden of Eden, there was no death. Death entered the world through one man, through sin, as a, as a consequence of sin. Death is the unnatural separation of body and soul. And if you want to fight about what it means to other organisms, if plants die and bugs die, don't, blah, whatever. Talking about, uh, talking about the death of humanity. The death of humanity was not a thing before sin. Now, if God had returned things to goodness, no, he would have just made mankind temporally immortal. We would live forever on the earth. Jesus would have come and would have said, okay, guess, guess what? Are you all living you know, forever now? But instead, what God did is he took something broken, death, the unnatural consequence of sin. He took that and he used it for something good. He used death itself to give life. The death of Christ on the cross gives eternal life to all believers. The death of Christ, the resurrection from the tomb, and eternal life to all believers, first in heaven and then in the new earth. And this is better. This is superior. Heaven and the new earth is superior to living in the, even in the Garden of Eden forever. These things, these things are better than they were when they were brand new. Now, the ultimate example that I use is I said, you know, God, God took something broken um, and, and, and he made it better. Not good as new, but better. And I use the example of you. Now, you're a human being who sinned. I know I must be I must be telepathic or so how, how did I know you sin you sin on a regular basis I sin you sin uh, it's not a good thing but you do it and that breaks you that breaks your relationship with God but God has a solution for this and the solution is shocker it's the death of Christ on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins now if God had returned everything to good as new maybe he would have said okay Let's just forget you ever sinned in the first place. Now you're perfect again. Do not sin. Don't screw this up again because I, I, I fixed, I returned everything to default before. You are you. Just don't sin again. But that's not what God does. Instead, what God does is he takes us and he covers us with the righteousness of Christ. Christ. So not just a lack of sin, but the, the positive righteousness of Christ covers the sinners. This is better than never having sinned in the first place. Adam and Eve had it good, but they didn't have it as good as we do. With Adam and Eve, before sin, before, all, before everything happened, before the death of Christ on the cross, they were, they were related to God as they were creation and, and he was their creator. And it was, it was a, it was a father children sort of relationship. But with the incarnation of Christ, God becoming man, God taking on humanity, with Jesus dying on the cross for the sins, with Jesus crediting the righteousness to you and you imputing, covering yourself with the righteousness of God, it's better than ever before. It's better, better than it could have been. And if, if you've ever interacted with a Baptist or Baptist congregation or non-denominational congregation, uh, and maybe some other ones, you've probably heard the sermon about Kintsugi, I think it's Kintsugi. It might be something else. But it's basically this, this Japanese, this wabi-sabi. It's this Japanese um, uh, religious concept of you take a um, you take a bowl, pottery, and it's broken, and then you, you fix it with this resin that has that has gold in it. And the gold, you know, creates these patterns uh, along the cracks. And now the thing is more beautiful than it was before because uh, it's, a, it's imperfections shine out and yada, yada, yada. Not Christian. It's got nothing to do with Christianity. Um, I hate that people use that as, as an example because it's nonsense. Uh, that is not what happens in, in the forgiveness of sins. God does not take you and then make your imperfections glow all the more. This is what happens. You are, a, you know, a, a, a pottery, whatever. You are, you are a vessel. And obviously, you know, you're broken because you're broken with sin. And God puts you back together. And however he puts you back together, he then takes you and dips you entirely in gold and covers you inside and outside with gold. So nothing of your original pottery, of your original clay is visible, regardless of how beautiful you thought you would be if you were just gilded around the, the rough edges of your sin. None of that matters because you are now glorified with Christ's glory. That's the sermon I would get if I was, you know. If I was in one of those those Baptist churches, that is what happens. God doesn't take you and return you to factory settings. He doesn't take you and glorify your sins with, you know, some gold gilding. He takes you and dips you entirely, head to toe in bap baptism. Bapt uh, gold. I keep saying baptism. I don't know why it keeps coming. Dipping in. 
and he glorifies you, it completely covers you head to toe in, in this glorious Christness. And that's what happens. Not as good as no, but better than ever before. And this is, it's just something that God does. So what I would love from you guys, if, if you come up with ideas of like examples where God takes something and he makes it better than before, you know, there's consequences, bad stuff happens, love biblical examples, uh, and he takes it and makes it better than before, please leave them in the comments below. Uh, I'd love to just nerd out about that stuff. But anyways, happy Pentecost, happy, you know, looking forward to the Ascension. God bless you. 